Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So we've gone over this for two weeks now, and uh, we've seen all the uh, symbology. We even see here that that's all to be interpreted. These are just shadows and figures of the true and the true place in heaven. Well, who can even imagine that, you know? Uh, so, so we have a pattern here below, but uh, it's likened unto that which is above, but uh, at, at, at a much more, well, what can we say, splendid, extraordinary proportion. So we're, we're waiting to see what that's going to be. Uh, Solomon did his best in, uh, in providing a, an ornate structure, and really uh, Herod went even further in the, uh, in the way that uh, it was all composed and so on. So it's quite beautiful, and men admired it. But even Jesus said, not one stone will stand upon another. Something so much the better is coming. And there was no need for the temple. Jesus had arrived. It fulfilled all of this. So there was no more need for this. And this was going to be uh, a sign to Israel that all things have been fulfilled. The veil in the temple rent, sacrifice has been made, and the priest now has entered heaven itself to make intercession in the true and the holy tabernacles above. Uh, and so we saw all of this, of course, in typical picture. And then, you know, those very arduous and difficult chapters of the Old Testament um, where we're going, you know, right now I'm in numbers and, uh, you know, you can kind of go through numbers and it's, uh, it's arduous, a lot of genealogies and so on. Um, but uh, all of that was the setting up of the, uh, the ordinance and the sacrifice and how it all had to be done by God's prescription and uh, everything had to be in order. The priest would cleanse himself as we've already seen. Jesus fulfilled that at the uh, River Jordan and then he makes the sacrifice of himself at the cross, takes the blood then, ascends up into heaven just like the priest, you know, and, and makes intercession and drops the, uh, the blood at the mercy seat in heaven where it really counts and uh, uh, makes salvation available and the spirit of the living God then comes and fills the temple. And now we're the temple of the Holy Spirit and Christ lives in us. So we understand all of this typology. And without this, by the way, I mean, uh, this is what, what we're relegated then to just ritual. It's, it becomes meaningless ritual. People going through motions, and that's all that had happened to Israel after a while. Um, and this is, uh, unfortunately, this is what happens with those who've lost their love for Christ, lost their love for the Lord, and they just turn worship into, uh, you know, formality. And so uh, we detest formalism, as did Christ when he was here. And he, he uh, said, you draw an eye to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Christ always wanted our hearts. Um, and so, you know, even in this meager moment here, we worship the Lord together. We sing some songs. But you want to sing with all of your heart, even if you're a bad singer. Uh, you want to sing it with all your heart. Uh, and so when we get to heaven and we're graded for our singing, I don't think it'll be upon whether we were in pitch or not. It's going to be, did we do it with our hearts? And did, did we come to church with our hearts? Did we uh, open our Bibles and wanted to learn f about God, even the, even the difficult things? Now, our great high priest has entered into the, the actual tabernacle. That's why we don't need a, a temple or a tabernacle any longer. We don't need a priest. We certainly don't need a sacrifice. As we'll learn here in these last few verses, and then, of, of course, the reiteration of it in chapter 10, it's a once for all settled sacrifice. No need now to repeat it. So we learned earlier in the seventh chapter, for such an high priest became us, that's an interesting expression, by the way, and the construction of it, I think, is intended to be. So, he became us. He truly, and we can say, well, it's becoming of us. It truly is. But he did, in fact, become us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So, now we see him in his ascended role as the priest that goes in. And uh, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people. This he did once when he offered up himself. 
So you see this begins there in the seventh uh, chapter. That's the first place where you see this once for all sacrifice. And then the reiteration here now, the end of chapter 9, we'll see in the last few verses. And then in chapter 10, uh, verses, I think, down in 4 and 5 and so forth, the idea of once for all the sacrifice is settled. So, uh, so we understand what Jesus is doing. Even now, you'll hear people every once in a while say that Jesus came to them and said this and that. I said, wait a minute, he's at the right hand of God. Let's leave him there by all means. So uh, here we are now, kind of in the text that we're going to look at closer. So now <clears throat> in verse 25, nor yet that uh, he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year. Of course, this has a specific reference to the Day of Atonement. It's called Yom Kippur. And that word Kippur, it's an interesting word, kind of a conflated Hebrew word. If you take the letter portion of it, uh, P-U-R, uh, you'll, you'll find there the root of the Hebrew purity, and that's the idea of it. Uh, so he's making atonement so that we might be made pure in the sight of God. Sinful people need to be made pure and cleansed. Thus Yom Kippur, Yom is a day in Kippur. We're talking about the day of atonement, the day uh, in which our sins have been washed and cleansed uh, and we've been made pure in the sight of God. That's uh, all wrapped up in that Hebrew word. So he goes in, the high priest, once a year. Now this will be uh, uh, right by the, uh, uh, the new year uh, when they start their new year. They have two new years, you know, they have a, a ceremonial new year. Uh, at Passover, and then they have the, uh, so to speak, the civil new year, new, new year, or Rosh Hashanah. And we have the Day of Atonement preceding that. So in other words, it's preparation, getting one's hearts ready uh, to enter into a new life with the Lord. And to this day, Orthodox Jews will spend most of the day in, uh, in their temple uh, during Yom Kippur. I had a Jewish boss when I was in high school, and um, <laughs> uh, of course, he loved his business. That was everything to him. But he had to go to synagogue on uh, Yom Kippur, but he didn't want to close the store. So he would let me run the store at that point. And uh, so he would, he would go and we'd have a good time with him gone. But at any rate, people got pretty good deals that day. At any rate, so we have the notion of Yom Kippur. It was that important to him that he would have to go to uh, temple and spend most of the day there. And of course, the design was that, that they would use that day for fasting and repenting for the sins of the year so that they could enter into the new year with uh, a fresh start. That was the idea of it. Of course, this had to be done each year uh, because the atonements that would be made were temporary. They were, in fact, atonements. Uh, so we, they were coverings, no more than that. Uh, so this day of atonement only meant we're going to have to repeat this and uh, repeat it often until, until the fulfillment would come. So uh, they had to go in, as it says here, every year with the blood of others. Uh, so they didn't take their own blood. They didn't sacrifice themselves. That's what what's makes uh, the fulfillments and the shadows, of course, were only pointing as arrows to the coming of the one who such a high priest who became us and becomes sin in our place and actually becomes the sacrifice himself, takes not the blood of bulls and goats and the uh, ashes of an heifer to, uh, to cleanse us, but takes his own blood and presents it. That's what uh, he was doing there in that interim of his resurrection when he appears to the women, go tell them, you know, that I'm risen. But he ascends up to the Father and then he'll come back to earth that night. Uh, so you say, why is he going up? What's he doing? Well, he's the high priest. He's entering the Holy of Holies in the presence of God and he's sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice and God is satisfied and the wrath of God is placated and uh, all is well. All right, so that's where it all comes now. So we have this expression, so let's, let's, it's a very curious one that, that comes here now. When we have, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Uh, so in other words, uh, Christ only had to do this one time. Uh, once for all was good enough. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't demanded that he do this uh, on, on an often basis. Didn't have to repeat. Doesn't have to come and, and die again. You know, there's all kinds of strange aberrant theology that's, that's uh, rife in, in the land and in seminaries and so forth. And one of them, very strange and peculiar one, is the notion of a second probation. That after we die and go to heaven, 
that God is going to put us to another test. Uh, now, can you imagine that? That's why, you know, this, these last two verses are very important to us. You know, for it is appointed unto man once to die. And that Christ dies once. So there was no repetition. In other words, we don't have to wonder, is it good enough for eternity? And it certainly is. It's good enough for eternity. So that's the proof of these final verses. For then must he have offered, uh, uh, suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now these are very weighty words, and as I've already said here, I mean there's debate about who wrote the book of Hebrews simply because it is anonymous. So the other epistles are eponymous. In other words, we have, uh, this is uh, James, the, you know, uh, to the scattered and so forth. Peter names himself, Paul mostly at the end in the salutations, if not in the beginning, uh, names himself, but not here. So as a result, there's some debate. But uh, it doesn't take much uh, to detect when you're reading the Apostle Paul because of the breadth of his sentences, and uh, so to speak. And some people would accuse him of turgid, um, bloated uh, language. Uh, and that's his literary style. And uh, we're glad for it because what pours out of each one of these phrases is so valuable to us. So we kind of pause and ruminate on each one of those phrases and say, well, now what does this mean? For instance, you have this expression, but once, well, we'll get to that in a bit, but once in the end of the world. Well, what, what could he mean by that? We'd say it wasn't the end of the world. Uh, so here we are 2,000 years later, and we might scratch our heads and wonder, what does he mean by the end of the world? Well, there's, there's several ways of understanding this, but and uh, one way that I have always understood this is that the cross is the apex of all human history. Uh, and what I mean by that is, and I'll give you an illustration that I use here. We'll put Jesus and the cross at the top of the mountain, right? And we have all the Old Testament saints here, right? All the way from Adam and Eve and Noah, and uh, we've got Abraham and Moses and David and uh, Elijah and, uh, and all those in between, okay? And they're all pointing towards and pressing towards and hoping for the coming of Messiah. Uh, their understanding is primitive. Should I even say that? I mean, really, uh, uh, when you read Isaiah, you would hardly call it primitive writing. But what I mean by that is the understanding of what Christ was to accomplish, it's seen in a shadowy form. It's so much easier for us now on the other side of the cross to be able to understand. Uh, so after Christ dies, we have the apostles and John on the Isle of Patmos. And then the seven churches, you know, which uh, represent the eons of uh, church history uh, in its various phases. And we all look back now. So in other words, uh, in the Old Testament, they look forward and hope for the coming of the Messiah. Now you and I look back and that's even divided by secular history as B.C. and A.D. Now, scholastics now have a problem using B.C. anymore because we all know that it stands for before Christ. So since the skeptics hate Christ and uh, secular historians and pseudo-intellectuals and uh, the Ivy League schools, they say, well, we can't keep using B.C. So they alter it to B.C.E. Before the common era, they say. See, they just can't give Christ his due, can they? Amen. So, uh, they, they, so they have changed it. Don't, don't let them change it on you. And, you know, we look at these things and we move right along with this. And, and we say, well, nope, I'm standing right here by B.C. That is before Christ. A.D. is a little different. It's a little harder to change for them because it means uh, Anno Domini, which is a Latin expression, is the year of the Lord. I don't know how you can fool with that. But notice that even secular history apexes to the cross. Might we then understand the expression end of the world as being when Christ came? That's the end of the world, okay? In other words, all of time either flows to him or flows back to him. So uh, that's my understanding of it. And I don't, uh, I don't really find too many 
scholars agreeing with that. They've got some other thoughts here, but uh, and certainly I agree with the idea of what most of them are saying. That was the end of the Old Testament, was certainly the end of the Old Covenant in that sense, because it was a much better thing that had, had happened. And so uh, we might say that. We could certainly say that by the end of the world it meant that uh, at the end of what was necessary to save the world, but we'd have to fill in a lot of words to make that one happen. But those are the general understandings of what this passage means. But I like to see it as, as uh, time, too. And the end of the world speaks of time, doesn't it? So we want to be able to see Christ as being the end of time. Now it was um, in the year 2000. Everybody was all worked up about 2000, you know. And they had people running out. It was the end of the world. I don't know if you remember that or not. Y2K, I mean, we had people here that were gathering in the back and uh, di bringing dissension to the church here and saying, yeah, you know, we better prepare, it's the end of the world, you know, and getting everybody to buy uh, shredded wheat and uh, toilet paper, I guess. But I wasn't buying into it at all, but uh, there were people that were, you know, James Dobson and uh, Jack Van Impey, and they really went, to, you know, they sold a lot of tapes. And I don't, I, I would imagine that many of them were very sincere in thinking that this was going to be the end. I, I said, nah, just, you're going to tell me what, to, two letters on a computer, uh, two, two numerals on a computer? Nah, I, I didn't buy into it. First of all, I had a Mac, so I knew I wasn't in trouble. But, you know, I can see the PC people getting nervous. They sold more computers during that. Oh, man, the stocks went way up and so on. Of course, nothing happened. And, uh, but people saw 2000 as a, an ominous year, uh, 2000 years from Christ. But then they forgot that Christ wasn't, he wasn't born 2000 years ago, he was born 2004 years ago. You see, so they, did, they didn't really know that, didn't understand there was an error in the dating that came uh, in the 6th century. So they didn't, they didn't account for Herod's death in 4 BC. So if, if Herod died in 4 BC, he, in other words, he was alive when Christ was born. So, I mean, you do the math. So he was either born, he was born in before 4 BC or right at 4 BC and Herod died right afterwards. I mean, you take for what you want, uh, but we have to go back to, so, so that's why when I preached my sermon, Jesus will not return in 2000, I got all kinds of negative responses from people saying, now you can't say when Jesus is gonna come or not gonna come. I said, no, I'm telling you, he's not coming in the year 2000. And of course, I baited everybody. I was hoping to get a little larger attendance. It, it probably didn't work. If I gave coffee and donuts or something, I'd probably have a bigger crowd. But at any rate, they came to see what my answer was. And the answer was, the year 2000 uh, really had happened four years earlier. And everybody was disappointed in that. But that's the truth, uh, at any rate. So we're looking back at time, and, and time is looking forward. Uh, they're waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And uh, I kind of look at it that way. So, there's another passage I find interesting here in Galatians 4 when it says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a, uh, of a woman. So, what does Galatians refer to when it says the fullness of time? So, you know, it, it kind of supports my theory here on, on what the end of the world means, uh, that it has a chronological connotation and the notion of the fullness of time or the end of the world. Uh, everything that needed to happen happened when Christ came. And so we either look forward to it or we look back towards it. All right. So uh, some more to say, though, about this these are passages. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. So we want to, we want to get uh, to this very significant expression. And I think we probably uh, expounded a bit on this earlier, and we'll have some repetition, won't hurt you. But what I like about the expression here, Christ once offered, and then the 10th chapter, I forget, it's the 12th verse, I think, where it says, he was once for all, once for all. And that, that really, uh, that's a wonderful thing, too. I would, <laughs> we've been teaching here uh, on Sundays about the limited atonement that Calvinists believe in, that Christ only died for the elect and so forth. And I say, well, no, Christ died for the whole world. He died for everybody. Not everybody believes it, but he did it. I can tell you that once, once for all. Oh, they say, well, that, that's once for all the, all the elect. I said, well, it doesn't say that, but uh, that's what it means. Uh, well, I have to accept your interpretation, I guess. But I, uh, I have a funny feeling that they're going to be embarrassed when they stand before the Lord of accusing him of, of just dying for some and not for all. 
Um, why, even in Second Peter chapter two, it's rather clear there uh, when it speaks of these blasphemers who deny the Lord that bought them. The Lord bought them? I thought that atonement was limited. No, it says uh, that He bought them. But they're unbelievers. If you go on in the chapter, you, we find them suffering eternal damnation. So, so He bought them? Yeah, He did. It's too bad they didn't take Him up on the offer of free salvation. So it was a once for all sacrifice on the cross. Now this might, uh, for any of you here that weren't raised as, how many Catholics do I have in the room here? Okay. So Catholics will understand this probably a little better. The Pope um, and the priests take the host in their hand and they re-sacrifice Jesus at every Mass. It is believed superstitiously that there has to be a Mass said somewhere in the world every day or the efficacy of the cross will cease. That's part of their dogmatic teaching. Um, and that's why the priest uh, and in the center of the Mass is what they refer to as the sacrifice of the Mass. So clearly what they're doing is re-sacrificing Jesus on the cross. At least that's what they believe. And, uh, and when the priest takes up the host and he uses the Latin expression, this is the body of Christ, then he breaks the body and uh, at the beck and call of the priest, Jesus leaves the right hand of God, comes down and enters the host actually, actually. I know they'll, you'll talk to Catholics, they'll say, no, that's just a symbol, but that, that's not what Catholics should believe. That's, that's not what the Catholics have taught for centuries. It is transubstantiation. Uh, so, so he's actually leaving heaven and he is coming down and being re-crucified when the priest breaks his body and then drinks his blood. So, um, so you know I'm not making this up. We'll go to the, their own resources here when they speak of the sacrifice of the Mass. The Church intends the Mass to be regarded as a true and proper sacrifice. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice, one and the same. Uh, for it is the sacrifice of Christ, the only mediator, which, is, which in the Eucharist is offered through the priest's hands. Uh, for it is the liturgy, in the liturgy, especially in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, that the work of our redemption is accomplished. Now you begin to understand then the doctrine of the church, no salvation outside of the church. That is a dogmatic um, polemic that was argued back, uh, I think, around the Council of Trent. But the notion was that there, you cannot be saved unless you're a Catholic, is what they're saying. You must join the Catholic Church. You must be a, uh, baptized as a Catholic and receive the host. And now we understand the logic of this, because the only way you can receive Christ is through the host and through the mediatorship of the priest, who actually sacrifices Christ at the altar. And uh, before you can actually receive, you have to go to the priest and have your sins uh, remediated. So uh, you will go and he will, uh, you, he will tell you after you confess what you have done for the week, that you must do penance. And once you do those penance, then you're in a state of grace and you can receive Christ. Once you sin, you will lose Christ and have to repeat the process. So, and as sacrifice, the Eucharist is uh, offered in reparation for the sins of the living and the dead. So I like to let the uh, priests speak for themselves too. Transubstantiation is the foundation upon which the mass rests. Catholics are taught that the priest must change the bread so that Christ can be offered as a real sacrifice, an offering for the sins of the living and the dead. It is the actual sacrifice of the Mass, that the body and blood of Christ is actually being uh, sacrificed right there on the altar rather than just a reenactment of something that happened many thousands of years ago. And this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I fear those who are called to this table. Is the Eucharist a real sacrifice? 
A Catholic would say that the Eucharist is a real sacrifice in that the Eucharist is the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. That this is not a different sacrifice from the one Jesus made on Calvary. It is the same sacrifice. Now that goes directly against Scripture because in Hebrews 10, 18 it says that with the forgiveness of, the, with the forgiveness of these there is no longer any offering for sin. There is no more offering. Catholic priest Father Richard Chilson is the author of eight books on the Catholic faith, including Catholic Christianity and an introduction to the faith of Catholics. We asked him why the Catholic Church seeks to continue the sacrifice of Jesus at the Mass. The Eucharist for a Catholic is ultimately a mystical understanding that there is what we call real time and then there is what John calls the hour. And the hour is present in every moment if we can if we can open our eyes to that, that reality. And so the Eucharist, by, by making present that, that sacrifice throughout history, hopes, helps, to, helps us to open our eyes to what is really going on continually. That, that God is continually, through Jesus Christ, reconciling the universe to, to himself. It allows us to personally come into that that moment and be reconciled with God again and again and again. For a Catholic, it continues before the sacrifice of Calvary. That it, the sacrifice of Calvary does not begin at that point. It begins really at the foundation of the world. It, it goes forward in history and it goes backward in history as well. Other Christian denominations celebrate that the sacrifice is finished. We asked Father Chilson why the Catholic Church chooses to focus on its continuing. Why not leave it finished? I don't know if I can answer that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know that's a, a, that's a real issue between Protestants and Catholics, but I, I don't know if I can answer it in any better way than I've already kind of stumbled on. The Catholic priest cannot really explain how that the finished work of Christ on the cross is continued today in the Mass. The phrasing is that it is a mystical act of transubstantiation that takes place in which Christ voluntarily comes from heaven at the beck and call of the priest when he raises the wafer above his head. Then he voluntarily again becomes a sacrifice. There's nothing in scripture that says Christ would ever, ever dream of doing this. Scripture says that Christ has perfected by one offering them that are sanctified, and it only took one offering to save us from sin. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice, which means that it appeases uh, the wrath of God, that indeed it does take away sin. However, the scripture is very clear about the fact that there's only one propitiatory sacrifice, namely what our Savior did on the cross. That's why in John 19.30, Christ said, it is finished. And when something is finished, it's finished. When something is done, it is done. So this uh, particular excerpt that I took is from a uh, film that's probably 30 years old now. But the reason I find it excellent is because it's uh, former priests, former nuns speaking from their experience. And, and that will help uh, when you're dealing with Catholics. I, I would imagine they'll have more respect because uh, if you go to them, go for the throat, they, they, uh, uh, they wonder, who are you? So if you, uh, their own priests that have come out and they now have the light, they, they share that light. And so this is a great film, and you can, it's, it's on YouTube, so if you put uh, crisis of faith uh, in the uh, keywords, you'll, it'll come up and you can find it there, and you can, if you know how to download it, you can download it and use it. Um, and I would encourage you, listen, it saddens me, when I talk to Catholics, they don't seem to understand their own faith, they don't know that much, but there's a lot of superstition. Uh, that's attached to it and uh, as a result I don't think I don't know how much they know of this uh, but they should know it uh, I certainly was taught all this uh, in catechisms and so forth so and, and this becomes the real struggle for us we'll think well Catholics they sound like they're saved you know it seems like they are they talk about the Lord they pray and and, and they speak fondly of him they live many of them live righteous lives 
And so it would, uh, we would conclude that they, well, that maybe they are saved and we're making a bad judgment of it. Are they trusting this to save them? This becomes the critical issue. Do they think that is what saves them? What, what Jesus did at the cross uh, it has to be redone over and over again, and they have to receive that, uh, the work, the finished work, by eating it, by eating the flesh and drinking the blood. So, uh, so now I, I have to wonder, well, are they really saved what, if that's what they're trusting? instead of Christ alone. And this is where it's kind of slippery uh, because uh, we're more than willing to say, well, they're, they're saved and we'd rather think that when in fact, uh, if you explore and find out what are they really trusting to get to heaven. That's why the book of Hebrews is so valuable to us because it is, there's no clearer place in the Bible uh, to denounce this notion of the sacrifice of the mass, which is is the centerpiece of Roman Catholicism. I mean, there are ancillary uh, sacramental teachings that I think are also blasphemous, frankly. Confessing my sins to another man as though he has the power to forgive them. Uh, receiving extreme unction as though a priest has the power at the end to uh, forgive all of my sins and these types of things. Uh, they're odious, but I think this is the central issue. So uh, at any rate, we might want to ex uh, take it a little further, and certainly if, if you're dealing with Catholics, I think everybody should watch the whole film, Crisis of Faith. All right, and if you can't find it, just text me and I'll send you the link. All right, so here we are uh, kind of reiterating what we learned in chapter 7. And for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and made uh, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So his sacrifices once and for all, not to be repeated. And uh, this we'll see over and over again now is our current text, once offered, and then Hebrews 10, as I've been mentioning, where we have the once for all. And this expression in particular, I find uh, very intriguing and very important. Uh, then a little bit later on in the 11th verse, one sacrifice for sins forever. That even says it more emphatically than this one. Uh, but this would be enough uh, even of itself to demonstrate that what Jesus did does not have to be repeated. All right, so we're going to move on here to the next uh, passage, which is the 27th verse, and very important as well. Uh, because this is the appointment with death, so to speak, and we all know this passage so well, and we do take it out of context, frankly, but uh, I don't think it, uh, uh, it doesn't disturb its meaning at all if you take it out of context and say, well, you know, everybody's going to die, uh, and we're appointed to die. You know, I've been teaching a lot about fatalism, and I want to uh, caution everybody about fatalism, because uh, you'll hear so many people say, well, you know, the moment you're born, uh, your, your day of death is going to come, and it's already fixed, and that's fatalism. Um, the fact that God knows when you will die is a, is a result of His foreknowledge. We've discussed this issue so many times. Uh, you know, I hate to beat the dead horse, but I really think We've got to dispel some of these notions that are somewhat mystical, uh, and in some sense, uh, we learned that it's paganism. The notion, you know, that, well, it's everything settled. And people have that uh, notion, and I think sometimes they're surprised then because they should have done something that they didn't do because, well, you know, if you're going to die, you're going to die. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, you'll hear people say that, or whatever, or that kind of thing. And the, the notion of that is uh, an acquiescence to what you think is a, a predestined and ordered problem. For instance, I mean, I'm not going to stand in the middle of the highway and say, well, if I'm supposed to die, I'm going to die. That's stupid. Uh, and so if you die by that, I don't think God's going to say, well, you know, yeah, I knew that was, I knew you were going to make a stupid decision like that. And there are many other stupid decisions that we make along the way, especially for health and so on, that people make and say, well, you know, it's, in, it, it's already settled when I'm going to die. And the, so they don't take treatments or they don't, they, there are certain things. I mean, I, I've seen so much of this, beloved, and this is, I guess I'm warning you along the way here. Uh, there's a lot of aversion to the medical uh, profession. People have bad stories and anecdotal stories and reasons, I suppose, where they say, 
uh, well, you know, we had this doctor and he said to do this and my, my dad died because of it. And I mean, everybody has a horror story. And I'm not saying that there aren't bad doctors or even stupid doctors, there are some. It's not easy to go to med school, in case you didn't know. And a lot of them flunk out. Uh, and uh, some of them do get by, but some of them, uh, like my doc always likes to tell me he, you know, he graduated first in his class, and I like to hear that. Uh, but, uh, but he also says there are other doctors that didn't, you know, and that they become neurologists. At any rate, uh, he, so he has a kind of a funny thing he says. But the, because of this attitude that people have towards the medical community, uh, they don't tend to take advice from the medical community. And I know you can argue and say, well, yeah, they all believe we came from frogs and they all believe in evolution and so forth. And I understand that. And that, that does, uh, to some degree, I think that has probably um, stunted how much we have learned over the years because we don't have Christian doctors, or too many of them at any rate. Uh, but not all of them are uh, evolutionists at any rate. And I suppose what happens then is that people then go to alternate means and think, you know, if they go to uh, this person is offering uh, uh, devices that no, the medical community doesn't know. I don't know how many people over the years, and this saddens me, uh, they get cancer, they reject treatment. Now listen, uh, all chemo does in most cases is it, it uh, stays the sentence. That's about it. And, uh, and it's pretty miserable stuff. And I understand anybody that rejects, says, I'm, not, I'm just going to die. Uh, okay, uh, I, can, I can understand that to some degree. But when somebody says, I'm going to go to Mexico, and I'm going to spend my life savings because they have a miracle cure there that they won't, will not tell us here. They intentionally are keeping it silent. There's a conspiracy here. I don't buy into that, not even for one minute. Uh, because I, I, I've known a number of doctors over the years. They're not all sinister. I'm not saying there aren't some that are and that are just in it for money or whatever. But I don't think that's most of them. And, uh, and so what happens is then people spend their life savings to go down to eat apricot kernels. Uh, and they say, well, they won't let us have it here. They know there's an answer to it. Now, now that's so foolish. Uh, so I just, I, I suppose what I'm doing, I, I want to warn you of that. Don't fall into that trap. And yes, we're going to trust the Lord. And yes, God knows when you're going to die and all that. But, but there are certain measures you can take sometimes along life's journey that God has provided wisdom even to atheist doctors so that we can get better. And I don't always have to go to the witch doctor. Uh, they're not witch doctors anymore. They're not called that. Now they, now they, have, uh, they have various degrees that they have and so forth. But they're really not MDs. And they have something. And you'll hear them on the radio all the time. You know, if you take uh, a drink uh, 50 quarts of apricot juice, you'll, you'll never get cancer. And, so, and people do it. And it's because they're vulnerable. And, and that saddens me, too. Uh, to take advantage of people like that, to take people's life savings and, and to promise them something that is a panacea. So, I, don't, so I, did, gave, me, I gave a rant on that. Uh, the text permitted it. How's that sound? So be careful on these things. And, and seek, uh, seek the counsel of the Lord. And I always pray, Lord, you know, I have, I have the doctors and give them wisdom. You know, guide them. To, uh, so, I, uh, so that they'll make right decisions for me and so forth. Imbue them with the wisdom that they will need to, to help me through this and whatever else it is. And so, especially when it's something that is, um, you know, terminal. You certainly want the doctors uh, to have the wisdom of God upon them. Okay. But if you want to say, well, it is what it is and, you know, we're all, we're going to die. It's already settled what day it's going to be and so on. Well, this isn't quite what this passage is about, but we can take it for that. And I, I've used it certainly many times. Say, look, hey, it's appointed to die. You better be ready. This is an appointment you can't cancel, I'll say, right? And that, I mean, that's pretty forceful. And I think there's, there's some degree, uh, some element of truth. That is to urge people to make spiritual decisions and prepare themselves. We are all going to die unless there's the rapture of the church. And so really, uh, prepare to meet thy God, Amos 4.12. Uh, thus we say, yeah, there, we're going to die someday. There's an appointed time. 
even though I don't know when that is, and even though there are things that I can do to hasten that by making poor health choices, uh, by letting myself go, by uh, getting overweight, by you know using alcohol or drugs or cigarettes or whatever, I, 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 I'm, I'm doing that to myself. I'm defiling my body, and so as a result, you know, I, my days may be shortened as a result of that. God won't be surprised on your funeral day. He, he won't be shocked by it because He already knows what's going to happen before it does. Okay. So it is appointed unto man once to die. I have one hallelujah. Thank you, Sherry. That's one, that, one word is all I need to encourage me. You get the right dog, all you have to do is say sick them one time, and they just start to go right at you, right? <laughs> all right. Certainly, I think from this, it's appointed unto man wants to die. Really, uh, it, it, there's an inversion here grammatically, and so that um, the, the appointment is that you only die once. Okay, that, that's really the way this is stated, in case you're wondering. So, uh, I hate to ruin the verse for anybody, but that's really what it means. Uh, you're only appointed to die one time. I'm glad to hear that, uh, by the way, because death isn't a pleasant, pleasant prospect. Now, we have things today where we bring people back, uh, you know, we put paddles on them and so forth, but uh, I, the definition of death, according to the medical community, is different than what God says. Death is the separation of the spirit from the body. And uh, I tell the story of the guy, you know, that I prayed over and they had him uh, on a heart uh, machine and uh, intubated him, uh, drunk, hit a, a telephone pole with his motorcycle, an idiot, you might say, and a totally unnecessary death. And uh, so they're going to pull the plug and they said he's, you know, there's no brain function. And I, so I went to preach to him. And the nurse stopped me before I went in and said, you know, there's no brain function. I said, I preach to people like that every week. But uh, <laughs> so went in and I'm really preaching to the people that are by the bedside. I'm aware of that, you know, so, but the last sense to go is hearing, so why not try? And that's when he started squeezing my hand, you know, and then I, you know the story so well. So I, I'm thinking, what? Guy's uh, no brain function, but he's, he's squeezing my hand like he, uh, you know, I'm saying, uh, you know, to trust Jesus, and he's squeezing my hand like this. I said, you're going to pull the plug on this guy. So uh, then he started wiggling his toes, and at the foot of the bed, that, the lady there, you could smell alcohol over her when I came in. I mean, she got sober like in about 10 seconds when the feet started going, and she's pointing at the feet. First time I had ever officiated a resurrection. And I went back out to the nurse, you know, that said, you know, nothing there. And I said, hey, uh, you better take another look in there because he's, he's squeezing my hand. She says, nah, that's impossible. I said, well, go in and find out. I'm telling you, you better cancel the unplugging, which they did, and he's still alive. All right. So... Well, it's 8.15. I guess I have to stop. We'll get back to this next. That's what happens when I get into these stories I tell. Now, Lord, give us your special understanding of everything in the book of Hebrews. Uh, it is indeed a deep book, and we require the Holy Spirit, so lest we give it private interpretation. Now, you help us in understanding not just the book of Hebrews, but all of the Word. And this book really does unlock the Old Testament for us, and we're so grateful for it. So um, we're anxious to know more, Lord, continue to, to lead and guide us in its truth. How thankful we are for the finished work, for the once, for all, forever sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, we have him and understand him to be our high priest in heaven. Thus we need no other. Uh, there he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And so we, we know that it's appointed to, that we only die one time and that there will not be a second probation and that we'll go through death or some kind of judging process again. Uh, and because of that, because we die only once, Christ only died once on that cross, only needed to. And we're so glad that you were satisfied with that sacrifice. 
So now, Lord, uh, with rejoicing in our heart, uh, we leave tonight. We pray your blessing upon us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come in to